Miracles Part 3. We've been uh, looking at Eric Metaxas, and we're going to be discussing Chapter 4 and 5 of his book, um, Miracles. And uh, Chapter 4 begins with his life a miracle and quotes uh, Gautama Buddha, of all people. Miracles in the sense of phenomena we cannot explain surround us on every hand. Life itself is the miracle of miracles. Now, of course, that was said by somebody who had very little knowledge of science, but uh, 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 Metaxas will take us through that. People are often heard to explain that life is a miracle. It is difficult to know what that means because it can mean many things. Generally speaking, it seems calculated to provoke us to wonder in the amazing things all around us that we might appreciate them and delight in them, and I think that's probably how Gautama Buddha was using it. Along these lines, Ralph Waldo Emerson said that the invariable mark of wisdom is to see the miraculous in the common. And George Bernard Shaw said, if we could see the miracle of a single flower clearly, our whole life will, would change. Interestingly enough, if I remember correctly, George Bernard Shaw was an atheist. Um, still, the idea that life is a miracle is quite different from what most of us think of when we think of miracles. Typically, most of us think of more instant and dramatic things as when a blind man receives his sight, or a tumor disappears overnight, or a dead man rises from the grave. For some good reasons, the sentiment that life is a miracle can sound like a hallmark cliché. But what if it's not? What if life, the simple existence of life on Earth, was as much a miracle as in many of these any of these other impossible, dramatic, breathtaking things? What if the existence of life on Earth was demonstrably more outrageous and more astounding than the virgin birth? The life on planet Earth. It's exceedingly rare that we should pause to consider the idea of our existence on planet Earth. We tend to take it entirely for granted, and this is hardly surprising, just as fish take water for granted and birds and bees air. We know that our planet supports life, and some of us even know that, to the best of our knowledge, no other planet in the universe supports life. But do we know why that is? Why should this planet be perfectly suited to supporting life? As it happens, it shouldn't. But we shall come to that. Many people, though, are of the opinion that other planets must support life. We simply haven't found them yet. The idea is that there are so many planets in our incredibly vast universe, sheer odds must dictate that some of them must be able to support life. One often hears that to think otherwise, to think that our planet is the only planet in the unspeakably vast universe to support life, is to be hopelessly arrogant. However, this is neither logical nor true. Whether it is arrogant is another story. But based on what we know today, anyone who asserts that it is not true is doing so not out of scientific evidence, but out of blind ideology. To be fair, a half a century ago when this idea originated, it was completely logical. That's because at the time we had very limited knowledge concerning the parameters necessary for a planet to support life. In fact, when Carl Sagan and others declared this idea to great fanfare, we knew of only two conditions that needed to be fulfilled for a planet to support life. We believed that certain kinds of stars were necessary, not too big, not too small. And we knew that there needed to be a planet just the right distance from those stars, not too hot, not too cold. Given those two parameters, Sagan and his colleagues estimated that about 0.001%, pardon me, 0.001, 1,000, of all stars in the universe could have a planet that would support life. And given the vast numbers of planets and stars and galaxies, there would have been a spectacularly high number of planets that could support life. All we then needed was to find, do was to find that life, which we promptly tried to do with something called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But as the years have passed and our failure to find the merest hint of life has sunk in, scientists have discovered more and more conditions necessary for life to exist. They have themselves begun to understand why we haven't succeeded in finding a hint of extraterrestrial intelligence. The more that we studied and measured the universe, the more we have seen that the conditions for life are far more stringent than previously thought. The number of variables necessary for life on a planet in the universe has exploded, while the number of possible planets that could conceivably support life has withered. The numbers shrank all the way down to zero years ago, 
Actually, of course, it would have to be one because life is supported here. And as the number of variables necessary to support life have continued to grow, the number of planets that could support life has sunk further and further below zero. I would say that, uh, uh, that it grows increasingly small fractions closer to zero. But the odds against a planet supporting life have grown and grown to unfathomable and dizzying heights of impossibility. But the popular understanding of this situation has not come near to catching up with the science. As of now, 15 years into the 21st century, we know of so many conditions that are absolutely necessary for a planet to support life that not only is it extremely improbable that any other planets can support life, it's extremely improbable that our planet should support life, our own planet. Uh, to speak statistically and logically, life of any kind should not exist and we shouldn't be here. Our existence is a t statistical and scientific virtual impossibility. Yet, of course, here we are. That may so certainly sound far-fetched, but it's what the most advanced science now leads us to conclude, that the odds are stacked so dramatically against even a single planet in the universe possessing the p proper environment to support life, that the existence of this planet and life is an anomaly of, a, of an impossibly high order. Yet here we are, existing, and not merely existing, but thinking about the idea that we exist. What are we to make of this? The sheer and increasing number of these conditions is staggering, but only a handful of them are easy for us laymen to comprehend, so we will limit ourselves to those. So he's not giving you a comprehensive list. He's just uh, scratching the surface. And uh, he has one of his few notes in the book for a fuller list of these variables and some non layman like explanations as to why they are vital to the existence of life. We recommend Hugh Ross's excellent books, The Fingerprints of God and The Creator in the Cosmos. So he goes on to say what follows here is therefore a tremendously abbreviated list, just a taste really. But we should keep in mind that each of these conditions is crucial. If any one of them is not met, life of any kind cannot exist. But since each of these many, many variables lines up perfectly, as they must, some physicists have come to use the expression fine-tuned universe. This is because whatever one's ideology on the subject might be, it has the overwhelming appearance of having been fine-tuned to support life, by whom, of course, is another story. The first variable we may touch upon is simply the size of our planet. Most of us have watched or read enough science fiction that we cannot imagine the size of a planet should make much difference. But from a science nonfiction perspective, this is mistaken. That's because the size, or really the mass, of a planet determines how much gravity it has which determines much else. Though it may come as a surprise to us if our planet were ever so slightly bigger or smaller, life here couldn't exist. If the Earth was slightly larger, it would of course have slightly more gravity, which has interesting implications. It's not just that a first person who weighs 150 pounds would weigh more, it's that if Earth had just a little bit more gravity than it now has, methane and ammonia gas, which have molecular weights of 16 and 17, respectively, would remain close to our surface. Since we cannot breathe methane or ammonia, which are toxic, especially ammonia, we would die. More to the point, we would never have come into existence in the first place. If you're thinking we might have evolved to where we could breathe those gases, that's more science fiction than reality. Simply put, life cannot coexist with large amounts of methane or ammonia. But if Earth were just a little bit larger, those deadly gases would not dissipate into the atmosphere, but would stay right down here where we would have to inhale them. On the other hand, if Earth were a tiny bit smaller and had a bit less gravity, water vapor, which has a molecular weight of 18, would not stay down here close to the planet's surface, but it would instead dissipate into the atmosphere. Obviously, without water, we couldn't exist. As we've all heard, our bodies are 75% water. Well, Actually, more like 55 to 60, but close enough. To think that the size of the Earth must be almost exactly what it is or we wouldn't exist is sobering and, frankly, not so easy to believe. But it's a fact that we need a planet small enough to allow poisonous gases of molecular weight 16 and 17 to evaporate and large enough so that water vapor with its molecular weight of 18 will not evaporate. 
And he goes on to talk about uh, the fact that ice floats. And most of you have heard that story. But there are still other properties of water that are dramatically anomalous and make life on Earth possible. Water's high boiling point is one, and its ability to dissolve a large number of chemical substances is another. Water also retains heat exceptionally well, allowing bodies of water on our planet to help stabilize and moderate temperatures. Once again, if water did not have any, all of these rare properties, life would be impossible. And of course, there's also the heat of evaporation and the heat of, of, of melting that are important. The speed at which our planet rotates, he mentions too fast problems, too slow problems. Um, the presence of an extremely large planet in our solar system, namely Jupiter, uh, and the miracle of the moon. Jupiter's grand significance to life on Earth, however, must pale in comparison to the significance of our moon. We, must, we may begin with the moon's size, which is the most insignificant, but nonetheless still tremendously significant reason for its importance to life on Earth. The moon's considerable gravity gives our oceans their ebbing and flowing tides. If the moon was slightly bigger, it would cause our tides to be much more extreme, since a larger moon would, of course, exert that much more gravitational pull. With 100-foot tides, there could be no coastal cities or towns or villages. If the moon was slightly smaller and had less gravitational pull, the tides would be insufficient to cleanse coastal seawater and replenish its nutrients. If the moon were any size other than the size it is, life as we know it wouldn't exist. I'm sure there are some tolerances to that, but um, the moon can't, for example, be the size of uh, Phobos or Deimos, the moons of Mars, and it really can't be the size of Ganymede, the, moon, the largest moon around Jupiter. <laughs> the size of the moon and its distance from Earth are also responsible for stabilizing Earth's rotational axis. If it were not stable or were not at its current optimal angle, we could not be here. Without Earth's tilt, we would not have our seasons and our temperatures would be much less stable. So if the moon weren't precisely the right size and distance from Earth, our rotational axis would have changed over the eons, making terrestrial life quite out of the question. Perhaps the most dramatic of these considerations has to do with the way our moon was formed. Of all the things we will consider, this may be the mo di most difficult to fathom. Most scientists have now concluded that the moon didn't form at the same time as Earth, but about a quarter of a billion years later. There are other theories, but as of now, most of them have fallen out of favor. As with much else in this chapter, the consensus around what happened has formed only recently, thanks to our increasing knowledge on this subject, and it's a consensus that continues to grow. Here's what the science tells us. Four and a quarter billion years ago, Earth was much smaller than it is now and was still in a molten state. It wasn't even really the Earth yet at all, so let's call it Earth with quote marks around it. Then out of the infinite reaches of black space, traveling silently on a fixed trajectory for millions and millions and millions and millions of years and light years, a planetary body larger than Mars homed in on this Earth and hit it directly amidships. This unfathomably perfect collision of two bodies in the incalculable vastness of outer space made life, and therefore you and me, possible. The roughly Mars-sized mass that hit Earth was for the most part absorbed into Earth so that Earth went from being Earth to actually being Earth. Our size was, via this collision, dramatically increased to what it is today, to the size we have already said is vital to the existence of life. Although that raises some interesting questions as to why life would arise before this impact. Um, but the remaining chunks produced by this cataclysmic collision began orbiting Earth and eventually coalesced to form what we now know as the Moon. But another thing happened as a result of this collision without which life could not exist. The head-on collision between these two objects was so perfectly aligned and therefore so cataclysmic that it blasted most of Earth's previous atmosphere into outer space, leaving us with the atmosphere we now have. The previous atmosphere of Earth was 40 times as thick as our current atmosphere, so sunlight could not reach our surface. If this collision had not happened precisely as it happened, we would not exist. Our atmosphere and our size were absolutely incapable of supporting life before, 
but perfectly capable of supporting life after. The addition of the extra mass on our planet also increased the Earth's iron content dramatically, allowing marine algae to flourish, which in turn allowed other marine life to flourish, which in turn allowed life on land to flourish. To say we wouldn't be here without this collision happening precisely as it did is an impossibly large understatement. But perhaps what is hardest to understand is that the current perfect state of the Earth is a result of a seemingly random collision 4.25 billion years ago. It is no exaggeration to say that in the infinitude of space for two bodies to collide as they did is like two bullets being shot from guns on either side of the Grand Canyon and meeting so perfectly head to head in midair that they canceled out each other's momentum and dropped vertically together into the canyon below. For such a thing to occur is essentially an impossibility, and yet somehow science tells us that this happened. It can hardly be understood sufficiently, but if this collision had been ever so slightly less than head-on, or if those hurtling giants had missed each other by hairbreadth, we wouldn't be here. Who could deny that to believe this collision happened randomly and by accident takes some more faith in believing it was somehow directed to happen? This is not to say that the collision didn't happen randomly and accidentally, only that believing that it did so is extremely implausible, is so extremely implausible that the alternative must at least be considered. The human mind longs for meaning and for answers to such extraordinary mysteries. Just how might something so outrageously precise have simply happened? But if that astonishingly perfect collision hadn't happened precisely as it did, and if the size of the Earth or the size of the Moon was slightly different, or if the rotation of the Earth was slightly faster or slightly slower, or if Jupiter weren't as big as it is and positioned exactly where it is, life here couldn't be even dimly possible, much less a reality. And these are just a small handful of the parameters necessary for life to be possible. By 2001, the number of fine-tuned characteristics necessary for life had leaped to 150. And when we do the calculations, we discover that the odds of a planet supporting life are less than 1 in 10 to the 73rd power. That is, 1 in... You can look at the number. This returns us to further, the further surprising subject of our moon. Since most of us typically don't think about moons or the moons orbiting other planets in the, our solar system, we don't appreciate the particular strangeness of Earth's moon, which is radically different from the other moons in our star system. To begin with, Earth is the only planet in our solar system that has only one moon. When comparing the size of the moons to the planets they orbit, Earth's moon is also anomalous, being far and away the largest, that is the largest in proportion to the parent planet. Actually, that's not quite true now. Pluto and Charon, probably Charon is closer to Pluto's size, but we cannot leave the subject of the moon until we touch upon the almost unthinkably amazing subject of eclipses. Most of us haven't considered that. For eclipses to occur as they do, the sun and moon must appear almost precisely the same size in the sky. Five, the miracle of the universe. In chapter 4, we discuss the statistical impossibility of life on Earth. But what of the existence of the universe itself? It is it possible for us to gain some idea of what the odds might be that it should exist? Most of us probably take the existence of the universe for granted, which is understandable. But let's consider whether it is appropriate that we take its existence for granted. Of course, the ancient Hebrews believed that God created the universe out of nothing, but almost no other culture held to the belief that the universe had come into existence at a specific point. The term that the scientists used for a universe that had always existed and that had never been created was a steady state model. But by the middle of the 20th century, many scientists began to abandon this idea to conclude that the universe did have a beginning after all. It seemed that humble Moses, writing 35 centuries earlier, had gotten that right. This is itself a witheringly strong argument for the divine origin of the Bible, though that's a wider discussion for another time. Even as the evidence for the universe's beginning increased, some scientists still clung to the steady-state model, and some still do today, perhaps in part because the idea of a creation seemed to imply a creator, which is, for some, an unpalatable thought. But as the evidence continued to grow, more and more believed that the universe was created in what eventually came to be known as the Big Bang, 
a term unintentionally coined by f physicist Sir Fred Hoyle in a 1949 BBC interview. When we think of the Big Bang, we cannot be blamed for thinking of an explosion that's like other explosions, which tend to be messy and generally rather unpredictable. But the Big Bang, the primal kaboom that created the hundreds of billions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars and planets, was a dramatically different kind of explosion. It was an explosion that was so extremely and precisely controlled that we cannot really fathom it. But to say that it was controlled or precisely calibrated can hardly begin to explain the degree of control involved. In fact, the speed at which the cosmos expanded out of the microdot, that microdot in question, was so outrageously perfectly calibrated that physicists say it constitutes the most extreme fine-tuning yet discovered in physics. There are many more examples of the universe's fine-tuning as it exploded out of the gate 14 billion years ago. We'll only touch on a handful. The so-called four fundamental forces physics talk about and which, with, with which most laymen are unacquainted. These four forces are gravity, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. And if any one of these forces were in the slightest degree different, our universe would not exist. Speaking of supporting life, which is carbon-based, we know that a great abundance of the element carbon must exist for any life to exist. For life to be possible anywhere in our universe, there needed to be vast amounts of carbon. In 1953, Sir Fred Hoyle, the Cambridge astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, discovered that the nuclear ground state energy levels of helium, oxygen, and beryllium had to be extraordinarily fine-tuned for enough carbon to be created. If any of the nuclear ground state levels were just 1% different, there would not have been enough carbon in the universe to allow for the possibility of life, both in terms of making enough carbon and also keeping it from immediately advancing to oxygen. To Hoyle, an atheist, the notion that this perfect fine-tuning had just happened was statistically quite impossible. But what else could account for it? He later admitted that it was this discovery of these extraordinarily fine-tuned levels and what he saw as the overwhelming implication of a guiding intelligence behind them that more than anything else had greatly shaken him and his atheism. He later wrote, A common-sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a superintellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to be seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Theoretical particle physicist, physicist Paul Davies had, has himself said that the impression of design is overwhelming. Another startling example of this fine-tuning concerns the ratio of the strong nuclear force to the electromagnetic force. Davies himself has calculated that if the ratio between them had been different by just one part in 10 to the 16th power, the universe as we know it would not exist. To put it another way, if that ratio deviated by, uh, let's see, I think that's 13 zeros with a, or with a one following it percent, the universe would not be here. But that ratio just happens to be exactly and precisely what it needs to be, and we are here. Still, even these freakishly tall odds pale in comparison to the ratio of the magnetic, electromagnetic force to the gravitational force. Physicists, physicists have calculated that if that ratio had been different by one part in, I didn't count this ahead of time. It's very small. The universe would not exist, but somehow it is just what it needs to be. Statistically, this is quite impossible, but once again, there it is, and here we are. The more science learns, the clearer it is, although we are here, we shouldn't be. Once we begin to consider, once we begin considering the details of it all, the towering odds against our existence begin to become a little unsetting, unsettling. When we uh, come to see the superlatively extreme precariousness of our existence and begin to understand how, by any accounting, we ought not to exist, what are we to think or feel? Our existence seems not to be merely a virtually impossible miracle, but the most outrageous miracle conceivable, one that makes 
Previously, amazing miracles seemed like almost nothing. But there are yet two questions that must be answered. The first is, why haven't we heard of any of this before? Mainly because what the public comes to learn, whether by, via the media or via textbooks in the classroom, always lags far behind what science learns. So some of this stuff is new. So if in recent years new information has been discovered, it doesn't mean that this information will be dis disseminated to the public immediately. Um, but he gives another reason. Finally, many scientists hold so strongly to materialistic assumptions that they are predisposed against these ideas and simply may not take them seriously enough to look further into them and may not broadcast them once they find out that they're there. This leads us to our second question. What are we to make of what has been called the anything but that theories, which rather desperately try to find ways around the mounting evidence for and implications of a finely tuned universe? The most popular at present is the so-called multi-universe multi or multiverse theory which postulates the existence of an infinity of other universes that we cannot perceive. Of course, there is no scientific evidence for this theory. Sir John Polkinghorne has said, let us recognize these speculations for what they are. They are not physics, but in the strictest sense, metaphysics. There is no purely scientific reason to believe in an ensemble of universes. Philosopher Richard Swinburne put it less diplomatically, to postulate a trillion trillion other universes rather than one God in order to explain the orderliness, orderliness of our universe seems the height of irrationality. Reason and science compel us to see what previous generations could not, or at least not, could not as clearly, that our existence is an outrageous and astonishing miracle, one so startlingly and perhaps so disturbingly miraculous that it makes any miracle like the parting of the Red Sea pale in into insignificance that it almost becomes unworthy of our consideration, as though it were something done easily by a small child half asleep. It is something to which the most truly human response is some combination of terror and wonder, of ancient awe and childhood joy. Now, my take on all this, uh, so far I don't find anything to object to in Metaxas' presentation taken as a reductio ad, ad absurdum. Um, I think one has to be careful with one's assumptions. Naturalistic assumptions are appropriate in the discussion of the adequacy of naturalism, but they may not be accurate in real life. In fact, one can argue that once naturalistic assumptions fail, which I think uh, Metaxas demonstrates fairly well, and which many other people have demonstrated very well, a wholesale reordering of foundational assumptions may be in order. For example, the theory that a Mars-sized body collided with the primitive Earth to create the present Earth and the Moon may be forced on one if one starts with naturalism, but it may not be the way the Moon was actually created. In that case, the atmosphere may have been rendered non-poisonous in a different way. As long as such considerations are kept in mind, I think the discussion in chapters 4 and 5 is a useful one. Uh, there's one other thing, and that is that he didn't deal with life itself, just the conditions that are necessary for life. And uh, I think that life itself puts additional uh, constraints, as witnessed by Eugene Coonan. You may remember we had that article before that... Uh, that just getting the genetic code is unbelievably unlikely. We have a comment here. Is he, is he a, a theistic evolutionist? Or, or uh, This is kind of confusing to me. He says, all these fantastic things about how Mars, and the things you pointed out, and then he says, well, maybe Moses had it right. All right so to, for <laughs> someone just coming in without any knowledge that could really be what's going you know what's well he hasn't really uh, uh, really uh, he hasn't really <laughs> revealed all of his beliefs yet we will we'll actually come to that in later chapters and you'll see that i think it's uh, this is spoiler alert kind of thing but uh you'll find out that uh, he does accept long ages uh, i'm not sure whether he accepts evolution itself 
And he certainly doesn't accept uh, evolution by purely natural means without God's intervention at any point. Yeah. I don't think he's gotten... Uh, and I, I think for good reason. I, the person that he's quoting for all of these amazing coincidences is an old earth creationist, which believes in long ages, but, um, but the position is that, is that God actually created the species in miraculous ways. And I don't know if you remember from reading last week that he mentioned that uh, evolution doesn't seem to be happening the way it's supposed to in, in standard theory. So I get the feeling that he's not, uh, he's not what most people would call a theistic evolutionist anymore. It used to be theistic sure. evolution included what is now called older, old earth creationist as well as a position that God started life and then simply right. backed off and didn't do anything. And those two positions have now diverged. And he would go, I think, with the old earth creationism rather than the, uh, rather than the uh, what's now come to be known as theistic evolution. He, he uh, um, recommended two books. Uh, was he recommending by Hugh Ross? And I know Hugh Ross has some really, to me, strange ideas about long age evolution with mm -hmm. God working in death and re, you know, making mistakes. I don't know. But he's trying to get Adventists to go his way. That's what I've... Yes, in fairness to Hugh Ross, he's also trying to get atheists to go his way. So... <laughs> that's not surprising. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that's working, but... Um, I, my own view on that kind of thing is that I think that you can learn things by listening to people like that. You have to be careful of separating out uh, the data that they bring to the table from the assumptions with which they interpret the data so that you do not take the interpretations at face value unless you find the assumptions persuasive. And in some cases, I don't. Uh, but I think that the point is, the point, he's, he's not really writing this so much for people who are, uh, who are believers in miracles and trying to persuade them to accept the science. I think he's writing this particular part for s people who are persuaded that science has got it mostly right and trying to persuade them that the science that we have does not rule out miracle. And on that particular point, I agree with him. Comment in the back there. Pass the baton. This class may be too strenuous for me. <laughs> <laughs> well. Come down a little closer next time and it may be less strenuous. <laughs> I read as a layman that there are certain things in the universe that a teaspoon would weigh as much as 14 element, elephants. I, I don't know how that is so, but it, it is possible that something would be so condensed. But I have real difficulty imagining how an inf infinitesimal dot could explode and provide all the matter of the universe. I, I just can't get over that hurdle. Well, uh, to, be, to be perfectly fair, for that to happen, you have to have something to make it explode, which is not something naturalistic at this point. Uh, it is also not clear why that dot would not turn into a black hole before it ever got started. Um, and in fact, my, my own view is like this, that if you project matter and energy into the past, 
and don't allow any of it to be changed except by processes that we already know. That it all eventually converges on a point in space at a particular time. And so there really is no way of getting around a beginning to, for the universe as long as you play by naturalistic rules. Furthermore, once you get to within that microdot size, the rules of physics no longer apply because they wind, they wind up with numbers that get incre increasingly close to zero and at the very beginning, in fact, are zero. And, you know, division by zero is not allowed in mathematics. And there's no particular reason why it should be allowed in physics either. Um, and so this is the limiting case. There's nothing particular that says that God could not create a galaxy here, a galaxy there, a galaxy wherever. It's just that people don't want to accept that that happened. But when they do, they wind up getting an even bigger miracle to begin with. So what you're, what you're looking at is the best case scenario for naturalism. And uh, one thing that can be pointed out is it still doesn't work. Uh, a couple of comments here. Perhaps the only way I can see it making sense to me at least is if I recall the words in the beginning was the word. We still don't know what the connection is between information and matter. But if John Wheeler is at all correct in his conclusions that at the root of all matter is information. And when you're thinking about information itself, well, why does information need space? The properties of information are entirely different from the properties of matter that we're accustomed to. So you see the whole issue becomes and God spoke, and it was. And so maybe this attempt to try <coughs> to trans, uh, trace matter back as far as possible may be an invalid one. Go ahead. Uh, I just might comment. Uh, I felt the chapter was very good. Uh, in fact, it's very close to chapter two in my book, Science Discovers God. <laughs> uh, I told you you'd probably see the deja vu. <laughs> incidentally, that, that book just came out in Hebrew. Uh, of all things, it's 11 languages it's in. Uh, but uh, uh, the one place I felt uncomfortable in, in was uh, his uh, naturalistic explanation for the origin of the moon. Uh, why does he feel comfortable saying that, hey, you've got to have a designer here, but when it comes to the moon, uh, it happened by this odd, uh, particular odd arrangement there. I, 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 I'm not uh, very comfortable with, with uh, that particular part of the chapter. The rest of it's great. Well, if I remember correctly, Metaxas is kind of a journalist, talk show host, humorist, um, probably, shall we say, his background in science is a little uh, skimpier than some of us here. And, um, and so he's kind, of, uh, he's kind of left with a quasi-authoritarian practical view of science. That is to say, if everybody is now saying that, the, that a Mars-sized object hit the Earth, that he's going to say, OK, a Mars-sized object hit the Earth. That he's not going to be able to say, yeah, but that doesn't make sense here, and that doesn't make sense there, because there's so many things that he's being told that science 
knows that didn't make sense to him before, but you know, they make it work. Uh, I mean, you know, try to imagine a journalist explaining how laser light works. You know, it's it's uh, it's almost a cargo cult mentality, and I don't say that in a demeaning way, because that's all South Pacific Islanders can do is big birds fly, they land, people get out of the big birds, they uh, have all kinds of things that the uh, that are beyond the islanders' wildest dreams in terms of their capabilities. You know, axes that are made of metal and that are sharp instead of the stone axes these people are using already. And it's not surprising that they just kind of take everything without a lot of critical thought because they don't have the basis for critical thought. Whereas I think for some of us, we can do a little better than that. And there are a few people who are actually trained in the field who can be competent with that. Now, the thing to remember is I think that the Mars, uh, Mars hitting the Mars like body hitting the Earth is in fact there because coalescing out of a cloud and somehow coalescing into a moon and an Earth just won't work. And the moon has enough chemical similarities to the Earth, but enough differences. We now have moon material, so we can actually measure it. Um, that the Earth and the moon, uh, the Earth-Moon system, uh, strongly suggests that that it, that it started out with very similar but not identical material. <laughs> and it's not clear how you would do that with a cloud that coalesced into two large bodies. Not to mention, of course, the fact that the moon has been spiraling out from the Earth, if you believe the story, for some four billion years. I'm not even sure you should believe that story because there are some calculations that strongly suggest that the moon should have been spiraling out of the Earth for only uh, one to one and a half billion years, in which case either the collision occurred later than standardly thought, which would really shake things up, or else that the um, uh, or else that the moon really wasn't formed that way at all. So this may be another case where this is where naturalism is forcing people, but it doesn't even then force it into a coherent coherent explanation. It's just the least incoherent of all the other ones. But even the least incoherent one, and this is, this is the point, that even if Metaxas takes these people on faith, what they're saying is these things collided. They had to collide at a fairly decent clip. And they had to do so you know, on a path that was set billions of years before. And then finally just kind of whopped into each other at just the right angle to put out just enough material to make a moon that will now eclipse the sun, Precisely. but just barely. Precisely. Precisely. And the interesting thing of it is that although Guillermo Gonzalez and some of these people will say that, well, the moon has to be approximately that size in order for uh, the tides to do the work that they do, I'm not sure that that's necessarily quite as true. But what I, what I find is striking is mm -hmm. that it is something that is precisely required for us to get total eclipses of the kind we have. And that makes scientific discovery better. And the idea that the Earth-Moon system was planned mm -hmm. for discovery makes it really hard to make, well, we're just one of many uh, planetary systems that would work. Because we seem to have the one not only that helps us with life, but helps us with discovery too. And there's no reason for that. It's the same reason that beauty bothered uh, Darwin more than extreme mechanical perfection. Mechanical perfection you can kind of, sort of explain because that's necessary for best functioning. There's no reason for beauty. No survival reason for beauty. The, uh, the tide 
I can imagine the earth without tides. I'm not sure that is necessary, but this raises the more, the more basic question, uh, which we should deal with at times. That is a deus ex machina uh, question, or the god of the gaps. In and this the, case, we have the planet of the gaps. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> what, uh, where, and uh, where do we say, well, you see, you can answer everything by saying, well, God did it that way. And uh, this is a valid question posed against uh, those who advocate God to a certain extent. And uh, it seems to me that we have to, well, the, the basic principle I, I more comfortable with is with. Uh, obviously, the universe is rational. Obviously, things work by law and order most of the time. And obviously, sometimes they don't. And we need to accommodate both. And the question we have to face carefully is... Uh, what, what, what is your balance? What are your criteria for deciding, no, God did it or God did not did it? And, and uh, you know, I, I feel probability is a good area yeah. uh, to draw a line there somewhere. Uh, of course, 10 to the 50th is yeah. often used as a, a factor. Uh, I think maybe much lower than that myself. I'm next. Okay. Um, just about all the planets now in our solar system have moons. We keep discovering more objects and moon-like objects. Well, Mercury and Venus don't. Okay, Mercury and Venus don't. But uh, but you're right. The Every, bigger uh, ones Mars further away. Uh, Jupiter we thought had four, and then and now it has 57 and counting. I think. Planets closest to the sun don't have moons. Is that the idea? Well, that's kind of the empirical fact we're stuck with. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Are there any scientific explanations that make better sense for formation of moons other than our own moon? Are, have we looked into that as creationists? Are there any things that maybe make a bit of sense in somewhat of a naturalistic explanation. I don't, I don't know what the latest theories are. Now we're, we're photographing Uranus and getting up close and all of these far off planets. Are there new theories for formation of planetary moons? I haven't seen much on that. I think it's fair to say that I'm, I'm reluctant to use arguments about how naturalistically it can't happen unless we have a theory that can start making better predictions. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying that the naturalistic explanation is right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying that there's, there come some points where we would simply should say we don't know. And that's the intellectually honest thing to do. Um, and we don't. And the less we pretend that we know, the better advancement we're going to make in scientific uh, hypotheses. I think that once we are able to make hypotheses that can start saying, and if you look here, you'll find this, I think that's when we start doing science. Mm -hmm. uh, until then, we're doing storytelling. And uh, I'm not saying storytelling is wrong, but I'm saying that it's not right either in a certain sense. That until our stories start touching the ground and, and, this, and you can find this and you can find that. And, you know, If you hypothesize a giant that walks around on Earth, and it's kind of amorphous until you say, well, here's a footprint, and if you look over here, you'll find a footprint. And if you look over here, you'll find a footprint. 
now you're get, now you're starting to to, to give some uh, you know some rational right. explanation to what's going on. Um, I think that in one particular place, we've done that. We've we've, we've done that in a couple of places. One of them is that uh, at first for observations, the idea that layers are laid down and uh, in fairly rapid succession suggests that there will probably be very little uh, erosion between them. And that if two layers are laid down, but they're supposed to be millions of years apart, um, you might not expect to find nearly as much erosion as you would find for, uh, for really millions of years apart. Right. And, you know, uh, paleo, uh, uh, paleoconformities uh, or paraconformities, I think, would be one example of that. And perhaps even more striking is, I think, the uh, soft sediment deformation that suggests that these were done while they were still soft. And that's something that's very difficult to explain from the other point of view, but that is, you know, kind of obvious and perhaps expected from, uh, from a short age point of view. So at that point, short age creationism actually starts to become scientific because you're starting to say here's the hypotheses and here's some things you can find mm -hmm. and if you go to this place you'll probably find some more of them. I have another question. Um, from a creationist viewpoint it seems like we should postulate if we want to do a prediction predict that uh, the moon and the earth had simultaneous origin rather than one originating before the other, based on the biblical account. Now, if we take the fourth day literally, it seems to imply that the sun and the moon were created in the fourth day. But um, mm -hmm. many of our scholars suggest that they were ordained for their tasks on the fourth day, which to me would imply that they s could still have a simultaneous origin in the very beginning, if we want to push the beginning back, mm -hmm. it seems like they're put together in all the biblical texts. Sun and moon are, you know, they're partners, mm -hmm. they're twins. Mm -hmm. They had a simultaneous origin. Do you know if anyone's working on the dating aspect, the origin aspect of the moon? We had uh, Albert Watson, who's been deceased for a good many years, work on meteorites. We've had Robert Brown work on meteorites and the moon, too. Is there any attempt among creationists to try and nail it down that we have simultaneous origin? Um, I think that most uh, scientists would say that the moon and the Uh, and meteorites have simultaneous origin for to right. limit the measurement, makes sense. and that the reason the Earth doesn't have provable simultaneous origin is because the Earth's surface has been resurfaced multiple times, and that we don't have any original crust. Well, that's you know it's an argument from almost an argument from silence in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly doesn't have much in the way of predictive power. I suppose that you could say the one prediction it would make is that you're not going to have six billion year old Earth material. Uh, that it should stop, at, uh, it should be either equal to or less than 4.56 billion years. Right. Okay. Uh, by conventional radiometric dating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a comment in the back. A question out of ignorance: um, If we have, if we have Precambrian layers uh, in there, I don't know, in the middle of continents, then how is it that the Earth has supposedly been resurfaced? I mean, it seems like if continents collide and they sort of have the general shape, how, how, how does that explain? Well, the re some of the resurfacing is supposed to have been done very early. My understanding is that the oldest material we have is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.8 to 4 billion years old by conventional dating. 
and so we don't have anything that goes back to 4.6 billion years. So resurf resurfacing occurred and then it stopped. Is that what, what they're saying? Some resurfacing is supposed to be still reoccurring, but much of it, re uh, uh, the Canadian Shield, for example, uh, is pretty much, you know, as close to original material as we have. Some stuff in, in North Central Africa is also in that same general range. I think there's some stuff in Australia that's that way too. And then the other layers that are laid on top of those. Um, as far as that goes, the basal layer in the Black Grand Canyon is um, billions of years old in, in conventional dating. So I read a, um, I don't know, read an article um, that suggests that uh, Thelia, this is the Mars, the proposed Mars-like thing that crashed into Earth, supposedly, created, yeah. thereby creating the moon. I'm not sure if that's the, na the name that they give to the... To the maybe it hit 3.8 billion years old, and that's why we can't go any further than that. That's not what I'm suggesting. But... Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, uh, that... Apparently, there's some slight differences in moon rock than earth rock, and so the idea is that, you know, they claim to be detecting part of the, I don't know, I'm not sure I'm able to represent this correctly, but it's like, they, they, basically, they're, they have this idea that maybe Thelia and earth originated in the same zone and had very, very similar composition as a result. Uh, and so there's, they detect a difference, but um, it took them a long while to detect a difference. But it isn't a very great, very great difference, yeah. Right, right. So, so just back to his question as to whether there's evidence for simultaneous uh, origin of the moon, and, uh, well, the moon and Earth, in this case it would be Thelia and, and Earth, that maybe some scientists think that there's some evidence for that. Um. One of the things to keep in mind is when people are doing this, they, the actual measurements that they're doing have to do with the percentage of iron and titanium and whatever in Earth's crust and that in what we can get of the moon, which isn't very deep, by the way. And nobody took two-mile two drilling rigs to the, uh, the moon surface, let alone uh, uh, you know, get anywhere near the core. And the fact of the matter is, even on the Earth, we are speculating from what we see come up from, uh, you know, volcanoes and stuff, as to what the really deep stuff is. <coughs> and and we do have some speculations that can be supported by seismic waves that go through either the Earth or apparently the Moon also, because we did set up some measuring devices and some other things have crashed into the Moon in the meantime, and and so we can get some kind of an idea of of what the moon's core is like. But we're, we make measurements that are, that we try to interpret using simplistic models. <laughs> and then we make assumptions out of those models as to what's inside the earth and what's inside the moon. Um, and the fact of the matter is we don't know as much as we think we do. Because a lot of this stuff is wild extrapolations they're the best we can do and I'm not criticizing them but I'm but I am saying that you know we need to maintain just a little more skepticism of of whether we really know what's going on with either the moon or the earth well with that um, we will carry on uh, next week with Chapter 6 and probably uh, go beyond that. And uh, I hope that it will be as edifying as we had this time. So uh, see you next week. And again, in two weeks, you'll get a break.